scare him away. I have actual electricity in this room and light. Crazy. The electrician came over yesterday and he put in, uh, I think about four plugins, USB plugins in the wall. I've got a small heater about that big that blows warm air out very silently right away. It says way better than baseboards. It'll heat up this room in seconds when it's in the middle of winter time. I've got dimmer light switch, light switch and dimmer to adjust the lighting. And he's got these other proper uh, cool lights to go up. He put in these two temporary ones for me until I get all the, the sheet rock on, which will, I'll do that today. Uh, had to cancel fishing. <coughs> and um, for today, too much to do. What else? <laughs> Quick news on Adventure Dog is right here. Sarah has a French Bulldog. He's about the size of a guinea pig and he thinks he's the size of a tiger. And he's senior citizen now. And he doesn't think right. He doesn't back down and he goes ag aggro. And now that she's gotten bigger and she has aggro in her blood, she's a protector, right? Caucasian Shepherd, Mastiff Cross. And, um, uh, They've learned if they they have a little food quarrel, or if Griffin, the French bulldog, gets aggro with her, she'll now she's at the age of size. She goes, "Yeah, let's get it on," and they go at it, and it's not too good. So last night something happened, and she uh, basically had 
the French Bulldog by the neck and shoulder, shaking him like he was a rat. Oh, it wasn't too good. Blood all over the place. So I'll have to figure that one out. <clears throat> it's just like horses, you know, we get a packed string of horses. You always learn which horses can go tail tied to the other one, or which one has to lead, which one you can't put in the rear. How they gotta operate, because they just will not, shit will happen. So we have to figure out this, uh, the food thing, where they eat, how they eat, and uh, what scenarios where they can end up in that conflict, because I told Sarah, she's going to kill him. <laughs> she's going to kill that dog. It's unfortunate, but we'll work. We'll figure it out. Anyway, she's in me with, in here with me right now, and with the little board, I got her blocked in with me. And, uh, I got some voices to, he to be heard. We have some voices to be heard, I understand? I threw down a hundred bucks towards Melba's DNA study yesterday. I'll put that link in this video again below in case you missed it. And I inquired about how and what kind of samples there are. And there's mul not multiple samples of not just Sasquatch, but other um, other beings that we have heard about a lot. but never really had confirmation, but the, the DNA is there. So it just needs to be studied. And that'll help a lot of people's puzzles, possibly. So I'll put that link, that link in the video. <coughs> description below again and what else um, I've had a lot of people in the past send me photographs a bunch of photos but they're in some kind of a Google Drive and they'll click on it and then it says you got to sign into your Google Drive and then you got to sign in and then you use a password and then all of a sudden it comes back and says you have to email for for permission to access the folder and I'm like okay I'm out I don't have time for this shit so I'm just saying for all you who want to email me photographs please don't send them in some kind of a drive where I have to log in because it just never works out for me okay just copy paste them throw them in the email and then i'll uh i'll get them shared all right i'll be able to see them or share them if you want me to share them whatever you got going on now let's get some voices heard the attack dog has a bone <laughs> sleeping on a horse pad <clears throat> saddle pad <clears throat> excuse me laying on a horse saddle pad chewing a bone the only background sound is the hum of the bait fridge out in the shop. Anyway, listen to this. Hey Steve, my name is Ryan. I want to thank you for speaking freely about these beings on your channel and providing a channel for people like myself to not be ridiculed for seeing something we did not ask for. I've never shared my story with any social media group or BF blah blah because seeing them on TV, I do not want to put myself out there like that. No doubt, you and thousands of others. Like so many of the people that I've shared, I too am an avid outdoorsman. My earliest memories are camping, hunting, and fishing. I've had one visual sighting and a bunch of circumstantial things happening. Happen. My second my sighting occurred in March of 2001, just east of Titusville, Florida, which is east of Orlando by about 42 miles. Now, quick warning, you guys, I'm grabbing these emails from the very bottom of the list of my old phones. So there's a chance some of these are have been read, all right? I was with my dad, who at the time was a circuit court judge, and before that he was a Green Beret, which is the U.S. Army Special Forces, basically a certified badass. I now have a Ph.D. in computer science and teach computer science at a well-respected university. We were with my friend Mike. I'm going to change his name because I didn't get permission from him, and Mike today is a U.S. Air Force pilot. Finally, we were with Mike's dad, who at the time had top security clearance, he was a career military and retired into civilian job as an aerospace engineer at Kenny Space Center. He wasn't allowed to talk about what he did, but he worked where the space shuttle launched, and it's connected to an Air Force station to the south. So, you see, just like other people that share through you, we are hardworking, well-respected people in our community. Prior to the World Trade Center bombing, September 2001, people that worked for Kenny Space center or patrick air force base could bring friends fishing on the base by canoe or kayak access only these were the little tributaries depending on where you were of either the indian river banana river or mosquito lagoon since it was a military base the fishing was better because the fish weren't pressured we were mostly fishing for redfish and trout occasionally later into the summer you could catch snook and tarpon at the time of this trip this is our fifth time as his guests and we were fishing out of canoes. My dad and I 
out of our canoe and Mike and his dad in their canoe. We put in at the canoe launch around sunrise and started paddling towards the south end of Mosquito Lagoon. While paddling, we came upon a huge school of reds tailing in less than a foot of water. So we started to make long casts with our DOA shrimp when Mike, who saw the thing first, wasn't casting but just staring at it. And then his dad, and finally my dad and I. This thing <clears throat> was covered in hair, not fur. The hair was a reddish brown and it was bent over messing with something in the water. <clears throat> now when I replayed in my head to this day, I think he was looking for clams or crabs. We were not far from it, maybe 20 yards. When it saw us, it stood up and the thing was ripped. I think it was male because it did not have tits, but its general genitals were not visible. It turned and was barefoot but the bottom of the feet were tan, and it walked right across an oyster bed and up a bank onto a vegetation, all with little effort. The vegetation was impenetrable there, and no human could walk across the razor-sharp oyster beds with bare feet, and then into the palmettos and palms. None of us felt threatened by it, and afterwards I remember us trying to talk, and my dad was adamant it was swamp gas. All right, yeah, I read this one quite a while ago. He knew about it from his army training. It was swamp gas. I'm curious if you've ever heard others refer to them as swamp gas. I've tried to bring the topic up a couple times and my dad basically shuts down and says swamp gas. My friend Mike to this day is still unsure what we saw. We are highly intelligent people and we shouldn't feel ashamed for seeing these beings. When I think back and try to estimate its size, I know it wasn't huge. It wasn't a huge one like so many have seen. I'm guessing young adult. His shoulders were two and a half to three feet across when it turned. It was probably 24 inches thick and six foot six, sorry, six foot six inches tall. Probably 350 pounds. But like I said, the thing that stands out most in my mind 19 years later are the muscles and how human-like the face was. A couple of weeks ago you showed a sketch that one of your viewers sent in and it immediately struck me that is the one. Over the last 19 years I've tried to research these beings. There was never a thought in my head comparing it to an ape. It was a super muscular hairy man but proportionally proportionally larger than a human. I continue to monitor the blah blah site for sightings and in 2011 someone submitted a report of a sighting within 1.5 miles of where we saw ours. This sighting was by three men out fishing. I never contacted the group because of this phrase in the report. I saw a human but ape-like quote. Now after watching your videos I've learned this is the BFO changing the words of the report to fit their narrative. One of the emails you received was from a young man named John Townley, I think. He said he's 38 years old and also from Central Florida. His family leases hunting land in southwest Georgia near a small town called Morgan. What's significant is I own land near Cordell, Georgia, and lease hunting property near there as well. And like John says in the video, the hog population over the last 15 or so years has exploded. I looked up Morgan, and as the crow flies, it's only 56 miles away. So, one of these beings would have no trouble covering that distance. I've not seen one in Georgia, however, lots of circumstantial evidence, and I'm not talking footprints, tree structures, or wood knocks. I'm talking hair on your back, scared shitless, because you hear a growl so loud and then a blood-curdling scream. I'm not sure if it's because they have a sixth sense and know, and know that I know about them, that they approach me. This incident happened September 2012. We had planted food plots earlier in the day and set hog traps in hopes of catching some. In the afternoon, my father-in-law and I hunted different properties, more as scouting, but if a hog came out, we would have shot it. After dark, I got down from the stand and started walking back to camp, probably a mile and a half down old logging roads, the trip I've made dozens of times. But when I got back to the nice side of the cabin, everything was abnormally quiet, and I got that feeling that something is watching me. I take my 30 out 6 bolt off my shoulder and chamber around. Shortly afterwards, that's when I hear a growl, 
that scared me shitless and then screamed at me. There was no doubt in my mind what it was. I already know they exist, having seen one 11 years prior, 330-some miles away. My father-in-law to this day thinks I made the thing up. He doesn't believe me because we never got one on a trail camera. We run 25-year... We run 25 cameras year-round, and during the season we add another 30 to pattern-specific bucks. So, August until end of January, we have 55 cameras up. After that incident, I stopped carrying a 9mm when in the woods or fishing. Luckily, in Florida and Georgia, when engaged in hunting, fishing, hiking, or camping, you can open carry. So, <clears throat> I now carry a Smith & Wesson Model 460, which is basically an effing cannon. Not sure if it would stop a big one of these things, but it gives me confidence. But these things have changed the ways I hunt. I'm not afraid of the dark. Instead, I'm afraid of what is in the dark in the woods. After that screaming incident, I no longer stay until after dark. Or, if deer are in front of me, I'd rather spook them than deal one of these beings, deal with one of these beings after dark. I used to be in the stand well before first light. But now I don't go to the stand until after the sun rises and I can see. The best time to hunt whitetails is 30 minutes before sunrise until an hour after sunrise and an hour before dark until 30 minutes after sunset. Now I miss most of the prime hunting times and I'm comfortable with that. They aren't keeping me from doing what I love to do, but they changed the time I'm comfortable being in the woods. In the suburbs where I live, I'm fine going outside at night. I know they could be there as well, but I haven't heard, I haven't ever had that feeling of being watched or uneasy feelings. Like you, Steve, my passion is hunting. In hunting is bow hunting. But since that incident, I now carry that Smith & Wesson Model 460 and a Henry 4570 lever action with my bow. When I go pig hunting and rifle hunting, I no longer feel like the 30 odd 6 is enough gun. So I've upgraded to a 300 win short mag. I got the same rifle. This is way too much gun for hogs and deer, but I feel safer in the woods with them. Other cir circumstantial things are seeing orbs of energy. If you want, I can try to look through old trail camera pictures as I've caught the orbs on trail camera. It killed my camera after getting its picture taken. I've seen them in the woods and on trail camera. If you're still watching, man, send it. Send it and send roughly where that where they were, they were photographed, all right? One day we shot a monster hog. I'm talking 400 pounds plus, and it ran into the swamp. That is a freaking beast, 400. We've weighed them 250 pounder. Looks like a 400 when you first look at them, right? We couldn't get it out. We couldn't get a quad back in there or a tractor. This hog had great cutters and would make an excellent European mount for the cabin. So we got a chain and a lock and made an incision with a knife under the tongue and out the bottom of the jaw and put the lock and chain through and attached it to a cypress tree. We didn't want the coyotes to run off of the skull. We put a camera on it just to see how long it would take for buzzards and coyotes to eat it all. Coyotes found it like you think they would a couple hours after sitting there and they are on camera. But next picture was something triggered the camera and the hog was gone. When we came back a couple weeks later to check if the skull was ready, nothing was there except a broken chain with a lock attached to the cypress tree and no bones and nothing on the trail camera. What human is going to trespass on private property into a cypress swamp with alligators and snakes, etc., to take a dead hog where they can't get to it with mechanical tools, cut a chain, but leave the lock and leave the trail camera 15 feet away? I don't go up to Georgia very often anymore as I now have two young kids of my own. I'm debating how to introduce them to the woods. My wife believes me and she believes in these beings without having seen one herself. The huge hog that got taken out of the swamp without a trace helped her to understand just how strong and big this thing has to be. You better believe when I do introduce my kids to the woods, I will be with them and I will be armed as well, my wife. I take my kids fishing without fear and they love it. I'm sorry this turned into three and a half pages. This is the first time I put pen to paper on any of this. And as I mentioned earlier, I do, re I do research these beings from time to time. One thing that I don't understand is if they are a predator, 
Why in the hell would they warn us by growling or screaming at us? All the research I've done, they are really in tune with their body and able to be silent even though they can be huge. I'm not aware of any predator that warns their prey before attacking. So, if they're warning us, what are they warning us about? You're the first person to contact about any of this, but I've looked into what the people have to say, including Les Stroud, Dave Platt, Scott Carpenter, M.K. Davis, and Sasquatch Chronicles. I'm excited to look into your list of other people in the coming weeks to see what information they can add to my understanding. I hope as more people come forward, you'll be able to include more information to fill in the gaps of what I don't know. All right, man. Now, I hope, hopefully you're still with us and you're still watching the channel. And I'm curious to know if possibly you did pass on the knowledge to your kids. And how did you do it? How'd they take it? And how do you guys go about your outdoor activities now? Now that they know. I'm curious about that. And uh, it's a tough one, right? That's a tough subject <clears throat> because the fact is, is this is very, very real. And I don't know why, but it's very hard for your average human being to take this much very seriously once they get off the screen, once they get off the internet and, and quit reading or watching, they go about their regular, their regular uh, days, which is easy to do because it's not like you're seeing these things at every stop sign, right? But it's a tough one because you don't want to scare the shit out of your kids. You don't want them to turn them away from the outdoors. But on the other hand, if you have had this reality slapped in your face, you've seen it, smelt it, lived it, you know it's, it's, it's an honest reality. So, now what? Right? Do you not tell your kids about what's running around possibly in the back 40? Why not? I mean, if there isn't, I don't think there's a parent or a community member alive anywhere where if they looked in their backyard where there might be children playing in the backyard of the next house over and they see, say as an example, I don't know, an 800 pound grizzly bear laying on top of a moose that just dragged into your back 40 right there between the houses under that pine tree and it's, and it's, and it's uh, covered up the kill, but you know it's coming back. You're going to tell the neighborhood, right? You're going to tell everyone. You're going to alarm everybody that there's a monster grizzly bear that just came into the, the hood and it took something down and killed it and buried it right there. So it's not far away, you guys. It's there. Might not ever see it because it's mainly nocturnal, but he's there. Nobody has got to see a grizzly bear as an example in the back 40 with neighbors all around and children playing on their trampolines and swing sets and slingshots running around the forest and go, oh shit, honey, there's an 800 pound grizzly bear out back. Don't tell the Smiths and Jones we don't want to screw up the kids for wanting to go out in the forest. Don't say anything. Said nobody ever, right? But so many of us hesitate to share the frickin' truth with even with our with family, friends, co-workers who are too scared to share the truth. It's kind of, it's such a frickin' bizarre topic. Isn't this absolutely a bizarre topic? And just shows how bizarre of a species we are because we are so confusing. We just don't know enough about ourselves, I believe, our true selves. It's very, very confusing. Like I said in the very, very first video I put out on this topic, I said flat out, I'm more, I'm more interested in watching how people react right now. I'm more amazed at watching human beings. I've already accepted the fact these things exist and seen it. That's, that's easy to accept that. They're there. But what the hell's up with humans, right? What the hell's up with us? We're such a confusing group. And it's so hard to master being a human in this lifetime, isn't it? Isn't it a tough thing to master? If you even can come close to mastering being a, being a complete human being and understanding every single thing about your, ourselves perfectly. I'm babbling. We gotta get more people heard, but I'd be interested in hearing from, from this man again, if you're still here, if you would, email me back to whatever you've learned <clears throat> since that day you first emailed in, and also, more importantly, share where, share how, if you have gone about sharing with your children. Let us know how that went and how it's going. All right, I'm gonna, I guarantee there's a whole pile of parents up there that are, are curious too, all right? All right. Who's this? Steve, my name is Jeff. McComas. 
I'm from the very southern tip of Ohio. I'm an honorably discharged Navy veteran. Served during the Persian Gulf conflict, and if you were to talk to anyone who knows me, they'll tell you that I do not lie about anything. In 1986, I'd gone deer hunting in an old coal strip mine area that is now part of the Wayne National Forest in Galia County, Ohio. There have been many encounters with these things reported since the early 1800s in and around Galia County. It's Galia or Galia? Let's call it Galia. <laughs> well, this is what happened to me this bow season 1986. I'm not sure of an exact date, but I had scouted this area since early September and had built a few of the old-fashioned deer stands in Apache Woods that probably spanned two miles in each direction. There were a few old strip mine roads and two old strip mine ponds. I tried to alternate between the tree stands, going to a different one each day that I hunted on this particular day. I decided to go to the stand that was maybe 40 to 50 yards away from one of the old ponds. I got to the tree stand around 5 a.m. It was still dark, cold, and foggy. When the sun finally started to break and the fog started rolling back, I started hearing a buzzing sound. And I thought to myself, there can't be any bees nest in this tree, especially as cold as it was. And all of a sudden, I caught a glimpse of something out of the corner of my eye. I first thought it was a black bear, but as it broke through the fog, I made out what it really was. And she was maybe six to seven feet tall and was carrying a baby one. And the whole time she was humming and looking at the baby. Look, sorry, looking at the baby one. I don't know if it was a newly born baby or if it was sick, but she walked to the edge of the pond, got a scoop of water in her hand, and either gave it to the baby or wiped him off. But as quickly as she appeared, she turned and walked away through the thickest briar patch. And after that, I didn't hear the buzzing or humming anymore. I feel like that she was so into taking care of that baby one that she didn't notice me sitting up in the tree stand. And this is probably one of the most uneventful encounters that has been sent to you, but it's absolutely true. They do exist. And I know it to be fact. Again, my name is Jack McComas. I'm 53 years old. I have... 12 grandchildren, been married to the same gal for 30 years, and a truly honest individual. Feel free to use my name and tell my story. Told. Sounds familiar, too. Like I read this one way back in the day. All right. Been more, more than a few reports of people seeing them with a young one in their arms. And there's a video of that one with one on his back or whatever, carrying it in his arm, too. Seen that one. No shortage. Now let's get up to recent that I saved to make sure I'm not repeating. Four experiences, very easy to read. Hi Steve, I want to start by expressing my gratitude for all your good work, shining an honest and respectful light on these beings, and providing a safe environment for all of us to learn and share. Thanks, man. No problem. It's nothing without people like you, man. I've had a lifelong fascination with these beings, and your channels really helped me realize why. I had to accept that my experiences with these beings were real feels great to get these off my chest and share these experiences. Number one, after watching a few of your episodes that mentioned these beings, that mentioned these beings enjoying melons, I remember an experience we had camping when I was about eight years old. We camped at Levitt Lake at the top of the Sierra Nevada, north of Yosemite. It was our annual father-son. Hold on a sec. What are you doing? All right, she's a hurricane. It was our annual father-son fishing and camping trip, and there were six of us. This lake was several miles up a jeep road from the highway, and it was just us and a small group of Boy Scouts camped a few hundred yards from our site. There were still a few snow drifts at that altitude, and we tossed a watermelon on one to keep it cool. It was about 25 feet from our camp. The second night, our dads got a little spooked by some animal noises and sent us to bed in our sleeping bags. They went back to cocktails by the fire, but seemed tense and whispering rather than using their usual campfire drinking voices. Anyway, the next morning the watermelon was missing. Not a sign of it or any tracks anywhere. Our dads eventually blamed it on the Boy Scouts after what seemed like a heated debate amongst themselves. Us kids wanted to confront the Boy Scouts, but our dads shot down the idea fast. As kids, you know when your parents are spooked. We were packed up and on the road pretty early that morning. 
Number two, a few years later, I was at the YMCA summer camp in the same general area as the Missing Watermelon Experience. Each cabin of about 10 kids went on a one-night backpacking trip by themselves throughout the week. And this event occurred when our cabin was camped in a meadow by a river about four miles from the trailhead. <clears throat> a few hours after we all went to bed, I heard splashing in the river heading in our direction. As this being came out of the river, I could really feel the ground shake with each loud footfall as it walked past us as we all slept in a row on a tarp. I could hear it breathing and smell it too. I, li I lifted my head and saw something about eight feet tall walking upright on two legs. That was enough for me. And I quietly hid my head in my sleeping bag. The next morning one kid said that he saw a Sasquatch walk through camp last night. I said that I saw it too. Our counselor told us, told us all that it was a bear and laughed at us for believing in Sasquatch. The other campers gave us a little shit too. I think we all wanted to believe it was a bear. I'm 53 in all my life. I've told that story as my first bear sighting. But after watching your channel, I realized and came to grips with what we really saw that night. Number three, fast forward to early 20s. I just moved to Jackson Hole, Wyoming. I went backpacking with my dog in the go in the grow ventre wilderness it was midsummer we were all camped on a ridge below a steep forested slope and right around sunset the slope above us exploded with the noise of smashing branches and trees it sounded like a pickup with the motor off was rolling down the mountain crashing through the thick trees it was terrifying my dog quietly whined and dove in the tent which was rare behavior for him about 150 yards before it got to us, it suddenly stopped. I think it was the first time I ever felt truly terrified being alone in the wilderness. It was a restless night with a strong sense of being watched. And my dog was on guard and tense until morning. Later, when I told my friends, whom had grown up in the area, they told me it was probably an elk. Number four, most intense experience, was a few years later backpacking deep in the Emigrant Wilderness Backcountry, again in the High Sierra, North of Yosemite. I was with my friend, who also was with me during the Watermelon and YMCA camp experiences. We backpacked two days at... Hold on a second. We backpacked two days in a row for a four-night trip. The first night, we barely slept. Lots of noises and movement throughout the night, and a feeling of being watched. Felt like we were trespassing, not welcome. The next day, I felt like we were being watched, and I kept hearing voices. I convinced myself it was the wind or maybe the sounds of other backpackers in the distance echoing off the granite. But it continued throughout the day and sounded like women and children. It wasn't English either. It sounded more like Japanese or Native American. We barely slept the second night as well. I had weird and vivid dreams that felt like they weren't totally mine, like something was talking to me or controlling the dream's narrative. That's the best way I can describe it. There were lots of animal noises again and the feelings of being watched, being unwelcome, and fear continued to increase. By the next morning, we were terrified, but couldn't figure out why. We had nothing to pin it on. A storm started rolling in and I thought maybe a severe drop in barometric pressure was causing our freak out. We packed our gear, got the hell out of there, and down the mountain. We left a day early and we told ourselves we wanted to get out before we got snowed in. Looking back, I think we were run out of there by these beings. Feel free to share this and use my name, John Griffin. Appreciate you, John. Got you, man. You're a brave free man, the club of no return, right? And another. Good for you listening to your instincts. There's no shame in self-preservation, right? Freaking endless, man. All right, what's this one? Okay, I'm gonna read this one more. It may have been read a long time ago or may not, I'm not sure. It's how, I'm just unorganized having that other phone toasted with all my organized files. I think I might be able to fix that today, maybe. Now, dear Steve, thank you for what you're doing and I want you to know you have my utmost respect. I like the way you say it like it is. We have very few brothers in that respect and you're teaching me things all the time. With that said, I'll try to make good paragraph breaks for you. My name is Jeremy Wegner. Montana. I've been an outdoors man my 
for my whole life. I've been, a tra I've been tracked and followed by cougars, been in close unseen proximity to bears, yada yada. My encounter happened when I was contact contracted to paint the interior of a new house being built in a place that was remote, but not so remote I would never have thought this would have happened. The Bull Mountains. I noticed on my drive into this build that there were more turkeys than I'd ever seen. It was early elk season when I started, so I had all my gear in hopes that I could sneak off and bag an elk. I was a new dad and the mortgage bubble had just hit, so I was working alone, having had to lay off my crew because there was virtually no work to be had. I drove a long ways to get to this job. I intended to work late and spend the night every night. Upon my arrival, the general contractor left me in charge and left. Sweet, I thought. Night one. I worked until around 10 at night, went outside and jumped to my truck exhausted. I'm six feet tall. Sleeping in a truck cab just doesn't fit. But I was tired and wanted to crash. The nearest farm was about a mile away. I just lied down across the front seat, 2001 Dodge 4x4 with topper full of tools, extra cab, and crashed. I slept like shit. I felt like I was being watched. Odd for me as I like resting and relaxing in the woods. I woke up, made coffee, and thought, what a weird night. Why did I feel like that? Night two. I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched the night before. I was alone all day, and frankly, I obsessed over it. That night, I took a masking machine with paper and mask taped and masked off the windows to my truck from the inside. Who would notice, I thought, out here in the middle of nowhere. If it makes me feel better and sleep, I'm doing it. Screw what my tough guy buddies would say. That night, at the middle of who knows what time, I awake to my rock. Uh, sorry, I awake to my truck rocking pretty hard. I thought, pretty good wind. It's gonna snow and get cold. Well, I gotta piss. So I get out of the truck, and it's so dark you can't see your hand in front of you. I walk a few steps and start to piss. It's at this moment I realize that it's a beautiful night, warm and absolutely calm, no wind whatsoever. There are no sounds in the woods. Odd. But half asleep, half asleep, I deal with it. Why was my truck rocking like it was in a windstorm? Spider sense is now on full heightened alert. What is going on? I get in the truck, go back to sleep. Night three. I can't take the sleeping in the truck anymore. I must stretch out. I set up a thermo rest and sleeping bag in the bottom room of the unsecured, not even doorknobs, house. I don't feel good about it, but I must sleep. I don't think I slept at all. If I did nod off, it was an abject fear. I had an idea of what was going on. I just didn't want to admit it to myself. I felt watched all night. I couldn't prove one way or the other. I couldn't find any sign inside or out the next morning. The next day, a gen the general contractor showed up, was happy with my progress, and left me in charge again. This time with permission to use his RV, parked 50 yards down the hill off to the side. Sweet, I thought. Let me now inform you that I had two halogen lights. One I left by the garage door to allow me light to get tools from my truck, and one that I moved around with me to light my work area. The job site was an absolute horror show of a mess, hard to get around. So I left my truck, backed up the garage and the driver door, open all day long, and the driver door open all day long this day. I'd periodically go out and smoke a cigarette and check my phone. I'd only sell service or radio reception during the day for whatever reason. All normal until the end of day. Night four. At the end of the workday, around 10 again, I walked out to the truck and stood next to the open driver's door. I could hear a clinking sound about 30 yards straight below me. I stood, smoked a cig, and in the open light of the halogen lamp, light, simply listened to the noise below me. I was in a canyon with rim rocks to my back, a creek bottom below me, and a light slope with tree cover to the top of the hill on my opposite side. The road paralleled the creek at the bottom of the slope. The noise was a wood knocking sound that was quiet but regular. It was nothing like the researchers do. It was actually very quiet. But the same volume as knocking something off a wooden spoon into a pan, maybe even slightly less loud. It took a little thinking to sort it out. 
At first I thought it was a rancher opening a gate, but no lights, no dog, no truck or ATV, etc. Weird, I thought. It was like no natural sounds of the woods I knew of that were not man-made. However, there was no way a man was doing anything out in the middle of nowhere in the complete dark without at least a flashlight. I listened for about a minute. Remember, this is about 30 yards away. It was pitch dark down there. I finally reached into the back seat of my truck, into my elk hunting pack, and broke out my call and let out a few crappy, sleazy cow calls. This is when the shit hit the fan. I heard the stick get dropped and bounce end to end as it settled. I heard this entity run to my left around 50 yards. It then jumped the fence, crossed the road, and ran up behind me around 150 yards or more. It climbed the, it climbed the rims behind me and ended up on the top edge and stopped. It paused for around a second. It performed this evasion slash climb in a matter of time that was truly amazingly fast. I wouldn't even guess a time. Too fast is all I could think. After it stopped, it screamed at me in a voice slash matter, which I could only describe as aggressive, territorial, and terrifying. It was unlike anything I've ever heard. Very low, like bass, to very high, like a hawk, with all ranges in between. It lasted a few seconds. The volume was insanely loud. It terrified me. I knew what it was. This area is dry, compacted dirt covered in pine needles with a little dry grass here and there. No tracks left I could find. In the time I heard it run, I can say it was bipedal. The sound of a man running. Nothing like the sound of a horse slash cow slash bear slash elk running. If a person can't hear that distinction, I submit they must live in the city or whatever. We country kids know. I never saw this entity. I know I was within 15 or less yards from it multiple times. The thought of me peeing while it stood behind my truck right next to me scares me to near death. For the rest of the job, I would have to finish for the day, shut off all the lights, and then walk to the RV in the dark. Not too far, but around 50 yards in total dark. I was terrified every night. I walked with a pistol in one hand and a hunting knife in the other while wearing a headlamp. Funny thing is that I knew they would do me absolutely no good. We do what we can, I guess. I never had any more interactions that contained, that contained details that were of any interest or note other than the simple fact that I could feel this entity around me at night. Goosebumps. The feeling of being watched. It lasted for just under a month until the job was done for me. Surprised you stayed. Interesting note, when I brought it up to the old brash tough guy contractor, he had nothing to say about it other than the odd uncomfortable pause. His younger brother quit the job while they were framing. He wouldn't tell me why. I've thought about the question you pose about why these beings are covered up by those who are in the know. <clears throat> I think it is this, for the same reason all the skeletons of giants reported in newspapers throughout the 1800s were collected and hidden by the Smithsonian. The old Smithsonian, public enemy number two or three, right? I know you're not a Christian, however I am. I think this line of thought would be helpful in your endeavor of understanding why this information is kept under wraps. It is the same reason why evolution is propped up at all costs. Ever wonder why all the animals on cave walls from 10,000 years ago are the same as today? Shouldn't they have evolved at least a little bit since then? I have a couple of friends, including a First Nations game warden, who have had encounters. I have had two. Interesting, interestingly enough, just like my friends, just as you said, when they know you know about them, it seems, they take the pleasure in taunting you, or something like that. I have difficulty in the woods now. I wish I had your strength. I can't say I'm not scared of anything as you do. I feel pathetic and robbed of what I love. I'll send you more things I know in the future. Thank you for what you're doing. I do not know why I started typing this, but now I feel like it was some sort of simple venting. Thank you, I needed this. I just didn't know it. Sincerely and with respect, Jeremy Wegner. P.S. You have my permission to use my name. I'm beyond caring anymore. People won't believe this happened in the Bull Mountains. Jeremy, I read this before, man. I remember it because I was picturing being on a job site like that, and it sucked. Be interesting to know what's happened with that home, that new home and the owners since and their family. I wonder. 
or if they even still own it. Did they flip it? Did they desert it? Are they still there rocking it out? Who knows, right? And how are you doing? How are you making out? Have you had any more experiences or encounters? How about that old contractor? Is he, is he uh, submitted and given up the fact that shit went on and he's talking openly about it or has he uh, filed it away, right? Anyway, here we go. I got to get this room. He had to cut up my insulation. All the heat rose up. It's freezing in here. I got to get going and get this frickin' room done. Get it done and get this ball rolling. I'll be back again. Don't forget, if you have interest in helping us all obtain some missing puzzle pieces, you can help by possibly donating a buck or two or whatever you got to the DNA study that Dr. Melba Ketchum is doing right now. And I received more uh, information on some of the names, names who you know of, the so-called big names in the Bigfoot world and the sleazy frickin' things they have done to people in the past who have come forward producing DNA and the results. It makes me frickin' growl. Makes me growl. One day we'll have to expose possibly every single filthy, dirty thing those filthy pricks have done and make it publicly known with names and dates. Why? Because isn't that what we're supposed to do? Isn't that worse than what we are supposed to do? Tell the truth? Right? Stand up to the bad guys, stand up to bullies and tell the truth? There's no, it's so confusing how, why we as a species on average don't say anything when it comes to the dirty, filthy things that a lot of people do. Although you know they're doing it, you don't say anything. Why not? <laughs> isn't that weird? It's so weird. Hey, and I've been guilty of it in the past, but not anymore. Not anymore. We are supposed to be speaking out loud and truthful and exposing bad people and the things they do to prevent us from getting better. Right? Anyway, I'll be back. Shit to do.